says anyway that you can't find a friend in Hollywood? It's a crazy business, but for Betty White and Tom Sullivan, their friendship has flourished for over 20 years, right along with their wonderful careers. Betty White has stolen our hearts with her Emmy Award-winning roles in the hit sitcoms The Mary Tyler Moore Show and The Golden Girls. And Tom, well, is there anything he can't do? He's an actor, singer, composer, writer, producer, lecturer, and athlete. And he's also a good father. Betty and Tom are here to tell us about a very special leading lady who has changed both of their lives forever. And it is a delight to meet you, oh, Betty. And, and Tom, you, I mean. Hi, <laughs> good to see you, my friend. Who is this leading lady? Tell everyone. This leading lady is a golden retriever who was not just a golden retriever, the most special golden retriever in the world. She was Tom's guide dog, his best friend, right, Tom? There's no question. For 10 years, Dinah moved me around this country with, uh, with courage and independence and, and, and for me taught so much and taught it in the ideal way to teach. She never imposed the lessons she taught. She just taught. Dinah was Tom's guide dog for nine years and she took him all by herself. She took him all over the country when he was special correspondent for Good Morning America. And then the time came when Dinah, nine years is a long career for a work dog because sure. she was heading for 11 by that time in, in chronological age. and. So Tom was going to, you know, retire her keeper and bring in a new friend. But Dinah took a dim view of that. She, she did, didn't she? Wait, well, before you even get to the new friend and what happened, Tom, talk about her losing her edge. What happened to Dinah? It was a, an amazing experience, uh, Eileen, certainly more painful for Dinah than it was for me in that Dinah developed cataracts, and it's uh, obviously a little more difficult for an animal to do the job taking care of a blind person when she's concerned about him in relationship to her own sight. We were in an airport in LA, in LAX, uh, on a Tuesday, going to on American Airlines to fly to New York. And in the middle of the airport, Dinah recognized that she could not do the job anymore. And she started to turn in a circle. And when a guide dog does that, you're taught that that's basically the end of the line. And, and uh, she was saying to me, look, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this job, and I'm not going to put you in jeopardy. And, and, and basically, I hugged her and knew that there had to be a change. So when you got home, well, first of all, we have to say, you have been close friends for a very long time. Oh, for 20 years. We, my husband and I met Tom when he was in Harvard, so you know that was a long <laughs> time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a wonderful picture of you and Alan at the dentist's. Play, uh, the Playhouse in Dennis. The Playhouse in Dennis. And that's when you met Tom and Patty, is we, that right? We were doing uh, Bell, Book, and Candle, and we'd go over after the show every night to a little bar called Deacon's Perch to get a, a, a bite to eat, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, there was this wonderful young man at the piano. By the time I get to Phoenix. Oh, don't do that. And he would, <laughs> we'd walk in and he'd start playing all our romantic, because we hadn't been married very long, all our romantic songs. And we, we just all fell in love with each other. So when the show closed and we uh, went back, out, my husband, Alan Ludden, couldn't leave this, this kind of talent without doing something. So he called his friend Mike Douglas and, and uh, took Tom to the Mike Douglas show. And that's, that was a the very beginning of the friendship. Day. It was, and we, it's astounding how life takes its twists and turns. We stayed pals over the years, and we might, I guess we got together maybe once every three months or four months, whatever the time frame was, until this moment. And it is, to me, it's astounding that people, I'm not sure whether people fit places or places fit people, but there's no question that uh, Dinah created for us uh, a life circumstance that we never would have had. Betty became our family member through Dinah. Well, what happened, uh, Tom and Patty came over to dinner, and I said, how's everybody? And they said, fine. Then he began to tell about the problem that he had because he had brought in a new guide dog. And here Nelson is. Oh, right Nelson, right good old <laughs> Nelson. And he brought in a new guide dog, and instead of Dinah retiring gracefully and, and just living with, because they have a little Maltese and a German Shepherd, uh, she said, I lost my job, I lost my master, I'm going under the bed, I won't come when you call me, I won't eat, I won't run on the beach with you, I'm going to die. Yeah. She, was, she was. There's no question that Dinah was choosing to die. So I heard myself say, well, how about, you want me to try her, Tom? And that was a very presumptuous, because I had a family, two dogs and a cat that, right. <laughs> you know, should know. And it was a very tough decision. But what? when did the actual decision, was the decision made? Was that with, over that small item? 
I, I think really it was. I, I, when I look at my sense of, of oh, Nelson, have, you know, relax, <laughs> enjoy the show. Don't be nervous. Don't, don't find it difficult. <laughs> um, when I think about it, uh, I, I knew that there had to be a change in order for me to continue to do my job. But Patty and, and the children were s very secure in their sense that I didn't need another dog. Hmm. So this fellow, Nelson, came into a circumstance when uh, no one really wanted him there. The children didn't want him, Patty didn't want him, and I guess certainly I didn't. It's interesting because Patty confided to you, Betty, and I read it in the book, that in the beginning when Dinah came into Tom's life, Patty felt a little jealousy. Because all of a sudden, Dinah had opened a whole new world for Tom. Sure. And uh, where Patty had been his right arm, and of course it's a terrible job because she was also trying to raise two small children. Mm -hmm. But Dinah suddenly gave him wings to go out by himself. And it, is, it would be a tough transition. And I, I love these two wonderful ladies, Dinah and Patty, kind of eyeing each other. Because when Tom would get ready to go on the road for a trip and he'd see, uh, Dinah would see Patty's luggage, it was sort of like, Oh, is she coming? Yeah, and I must confess, I must confess, that, you know, this book deals on, on, on so many text levels, but I really wanted it that way. I wanted my independence with Dinah. I wanted the right of choice. I sure. wanted the right to select life. There was uh, an awkwardness. But the remarkable thing was when Dinah came to me, I, you'd think that it would be a, another trauma. She moved in, as these guide dogs are so wonderful about, they've gone through so many passages, because sure. they're first with their mothers and then with their uh, year that they spend with a uh, young 4-H person to get socialized, then with their trainer, then with the, the person that they guide. So I was another passage in Dinah's life, but I wasn't smart enough to know that. So when they pulled away from the house, I didn't know whether she would go into another decline. or She turned around, she checked the whole house out, she checked the dogs out, she checked the cat, and she checked the house, yeah, the housekeeper can stay, the gardener, I'm not sure about the gardener, the UPS man, okay, we'll let him come in. And if she just went into another, and gave me so much, a whole new element to my life that I and you have to And you have to mm. know, Eileen, that Dinah had just come off a real trauma. Uh, when Nelson came to live with us, it got to a place where Nelson would take away Dinah's favorite sock. Oh dear. Or when I would put the harness, take the harness out to take Dinah in the car just for a ride, Nelson would push his head into the harness because in his mind, that's what he'd been trained to do, that's what his job was. So we are really adaptable as creatures who share the earth. It's so adaptable because you asked Tom about the slippers business that Dinah was doing. Dinah was bringing oh, you your slippers. Well, it was it phenomenal. Was, uh, mm -hmm. one, he waited, he let everything settle, and we waited for about a week to talk to each other to see how she'd settle in. And he wasn't sure how he'd ex she'd accept a cat either, because she'd been trained to ignore cats, but off harness, how'd, well, the cat sorted that out right away. He said, all right, Dinah, I boss this house. Yeah. Dinah said, okie dokie. <laughs> and That's right. So, uh, but the, 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 I got off the question the with the you kitty. asked Tom. The, about a week mm -hmm. afterwards, I said, we talked to each other and I said, I think everything she does is so perfect and that slipper thing in the morning just kills me. I couldn't believe it. He said, what? I, could, what's I said, well, the alarm would go off at 6.30 and the first thing I know, I'd feel mm. the whole bed shake because she's standing, leaning against the bed with the, the tail wagging and I'd open my eyes and there's a blue slipper right here. <laughs> and I, so I took it. This is about the third morning she was there and I took it and I said, how about the other one? Okay, here's the other one. That's fine. Well, it knocked me out and I said, that is, that it probably is the best. He said, what slipper thing? She never did that to me in my life. No, no in fact. It took her three days <clears throat> to figure when the alarm went off, all the bodies came to life, and oh, and she puts her slippers on. Okay, here. Uh, <laughs> oh. She was, well, having known Dinah. Mm. I, this book be, was very poignant for me in the reading, and to retire a great lady. But I get the sense she doesn't feel she's retired. Oh, no. Not now. She has a new job. And when she went back to see you, Tom, after the settling in period, what was it like? It was an amazing experience. Betty uh, came to the house with Dinah for dinner, and I will tell you that I was tremendously uncomfortable. My sense was everything we were trying to build would be shattered. Betty came in with Dinah. Dinah greeted everyone, jumped all over Tom and Blythe, and licked Patty, and, and just couldn't get enough of her, her former master until dinner time. And when we walked into the dining room to eat dinner, this amazing, amazing lady Dinah walked over to uh, her new amazing mistress, 
laid behind the chair and that was it. She defined that Betty represented her sense of where she now belonged and was not offended, uh, actually assumed that that was the correct thing to do. We were all jabbering, so, but guess who noticed that yes, Dinah went uh, behind Tom my chair? Wouldn't that. you know yes. that? You know, you for so many years have been an animal activist saying that we don't know pain when animals feel it, we don't appreciate that they need special care and love, and here is this leading lady that you write about that makes us all realize how very special an animal can be. Well, how much you can communicate with yes. an animal and how much they communicate back if you just pay attention. And you know what? That's the key. I wasn't paying attention. When Dinah came into my life, I did everything wrong. I, I presumed that because she'd been trained, we could go running on the beach the first day I got her. I presumed that because she had been trained, I could go on uh, a 10-day trip a week after she was here and she'd be just fine. I presumed that Dinah could take me into any difficult situation and just cope because she'd been trained. But you presume that about Patty, too, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> it's, but it's, you know, it, and, and it, uh, Dinah was sending me messages all the time that well, I was missing. So it is a line. Uh, you know, Sue Ann Nivens. I mean, uh, will you ever have a character like her again? No, and she would, and I think she was such a bluff. I don't believe a word she ever said. I think all these wonderful affairs that she had were all in her mind. Yeah. I'm sure they were. Oh, but we oh, laughed and we laughed. <laughs> <laughs> that whole ensemble, was it as close a group as yes. we did? Yes. Oh, my goodness, yes. We did a reunion not too long ago where a retrospective. And we were all seated on a couch through the whole thing, and they would run the tapes, and then we would talk. Well, of course, everybody said, why don't they do a retrospective, you know, another show of where are they now thing. Well, without Ted Knight, you can't. Yeah. So we would be watching the clips, and pretty soon this would break us up, and, that, and the tears would start. We got to the last show, which I've never seen other than underwater, and none of us has. And we got to the last clip that they used from the very last show, and here's... Mary sitting on the arm of the couch by now next to me, and I feel drip, oh. drip on my shoulder. And I, oh. I look down the whole thing, and everybody, the tears are kind of going out, you know, not just down, mm. but out this way. Nobody said a thing. We've never seen, we've seen that last show maybe a hundred times, and never seen it Are you giving me permission to cry on our last show? You <laughs> bet, honey. I, I just want to say, if you, if you don't cry, you're going to get a stunt well, check. Well, it's been hard not to for the last two weeks. I'll and tell you. I, and you know, I shouldn't talk about last shows. No, or it's all right. You, it occurs to me, though, when you work in an ensemble, and I would imagine similar to this collaboration you and Tom just went through, there has to be a real element of trust in each other. I mean, oh. there are some wicked things the press can do to people and tear oh, them apart. Oh, you've noticed? Yes. Oh, isn't that <laughs> perceptive? But isn't it true that you have to really trust one another and that that does it come with time or is it a given in the beginning? I think it's chemistry, Eileen. I really do. That uh, you know in the beginning that you hope this is going to happen. You, you have that. There's a second level instinct. But it takes a while to make sure that, you know, brush the sand off of that, make sure the rock is under there. And it does take a little while to do it. But you almost know from the word go going in. How about with Golden Girls? Same thing. Same thing exactly. We four of us came together with careers in place. It wasn't like there was one new person that, oh, well, I want to be sure that I have enough lines. I think we all were professional enough. We show up on time. Our lines are learned. We don't spend two days in the, in the hair room. And it... Uh, the first time we read the first pilot script together, you could hear, tell somebody would throw a line and somebody else would bat it back, and you knew, you better, if you're going to bat something over that net, you better be ready because you're going to get it right back uh -huh. again. Uh -huh. And professionally, we trusted each other and then gradually relaxed into such a friendship that it's, it's, it's more than that, we're related. Doesn't it make you angry when some folks who just don't have anything else to do write that you don't get on? Oh, they don't want to hear that we get along. What? duller story is that, that these girls all love each other and isn't that swell. So they have, I think it's about every four months, they have a storming off the set. We are not going to, one time we all four stormed off because the writing was ridiculous and the writers were so upset that they went away and in 20 minutes they rewrote the show and they came back. The writers had that glued up on the wall of their office. They love they it. They said, if we, can re, if we can write one of these shows in 20 <laughs> minutes, we're better than we thought we were. And you know, as you write about in the very last chapter, the whole book is so moving that you two have just done, but you write about how you get a week to actually prepare for Golden Girls for any, any show before mm -hmm. you do two tape versions in front of an audience and you have time to memorize and how amazing it is mm. that Tom, everything you do is by memory, isn't it? I think it is. You know, it's, it's when, I, when I've done Betty's form of television and I say Betty's form because 
<laughs> she virtually created it. There was Edison, there was Marconi, and there, there was, was Graham Bell, and there Alan was what? Alan used to say I was a star of a uh, pioneer in silent television. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, li when life was Eli with Elizabeth was great. I, I have to say that uh, uh, the hardest thing in, in Betty's form for me to do is that writers rewrite. So I'd come in on, on first day completely prepared because that was the only way I could do the readings. And now the rewrite starts. And sometimes there are four or five mm -hmm. in a week. Uh, the brain begins to get pretty mushed by the time the week ends. And, and that's why most real uh, long-term talents in Betty's work carry scripts quite a while. Now, Betty doesn't. Betty, you virtually do it the way I do. Everybody learns differently, sure. but but Tom couldn't rehearse. He couldn't. He couldn't do a first read. There are directors who still think that. <laughs> that yeah. No, but I mean, he had no other. other he had to know that script going in. Yeah, but you have. I mean, it's very clear in this book that you use senses that we only know we have that we do not use in it, full. It's fascinating, Eileen. I think that the, that my sensory approach to life is very much like Dinah's sensory approach to life. There's a there's a whole undercurrent of information that Dinah knew and couldn't define to me until I could read her language, mm -hmm. and that I know and don't define to people because I tend to take it for granted. Yes. I've never met an ugly person unless they wanted to be. I understand the feeling of a handshake it's when it's well meant. It's the most amazing thing. Uh, your adventures with Good Morning America and the things that you do for sport in real life, they were not just for Good Morning America. You do ski. I do. Uh, yes, water I do. and snow. Uh, here you are. We're looking, Tom, at you skiing, and I think that's Sully. Tommy, your son behind you, I'm not sure. Oh, that's the old piece from Good Morning America. Right, uh-huh. Um, Sully is Tommy's nick uh, young Tom's nickname, but there you go. Now, no one's holding your arm. You're on your own. Have you staked out the slope before you do this? How does it work? No, you're really guide dependent. The guide skis, uh, in this case, the guide was skiing in front of me using poles, tapping them for me oh, to follow. Okay. In most cases, the guide skis behind and calls the turns. The greatest freedom on a mountain is when the guide can say, it's clear, go. And Betty has seen this. Betty comes to Colorado at Christmas with us. I couldn't believe seeing him ski because there he's skiing slowly in that clip you just saw. But he, he, we went up in a snowcat to the top of the, because I don't ski. And Patty and I went up, and here's Tom as a surprise. He's at the top of this this slope. So he waved to us and took off, and it down the slope. And well, my heart was in my mouth. It's amazing. You want to take a little trip down memory lane? <clears throat> you were saying when you walked into the studio that it reminded you of the special that you and I had done together. It was one of the real joys of my life. No kidding. And mine. So we have a little tiny clip. Oh, oh I, want to see that. I haven't seen this. This is Tom and I uh, doing a little tune together. What? Just when you think you really changed him, he'll leave you again. Don't fall in love with a dreamer, cause he'll break you in. Oh, I knew that. <laughs> that was, that was little, our promotional little, little effort. Little shake you in the, yeah. shake <laughs> you in the pitch. Oh that was God. at 9 in the morning. That Ooh, wasn't the special. That's thank a, God. We had fun oh together God, doing that. I sounded that. like a deaf person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this voice, that, God's gift, but, but you work at it. Is your voice stronger because you depend solely on the vocal instrument and your ears? Or, uh, I, it's, it's hard for me to explain, but I'm wondering if you, you, you hear music differently than we do. Do you know what I mean? You know, it's interesting that you bring this up because I definitely do hear it on a different level. And... Part of what we have experienced in writing together has to do with the information that we've gained that may be beyond the, the sort of standard frame of, of, of reference. Uh, I, there's no question that, that you learn compensations. And there's no question that life doles out special gifts to people in order to let them compensate. Huh? The voice is a special gift, but, but some of the senses that we let lie fallow that we have, I've learned in the, which I never, going in we were going to write about one thing and I find there are things that I now listen and hear that I never did before we settled in, before I learned as much as I do. I, I smell things, I try to identify, you know, where we, I'm trying to use some of the things that he tells me you're wasting and he's right. But you know what happened, and this is really true, this is not a, frankly this is not a book plug, this is a point. I didn't understand that about myself 
until I had to start probing what Dinah knew. Meaning, mm -hmm. when I started to have to abstract what Dinah could understand, the language, the levels, the instinct, then I started to say, wait a minute, I must do that. <laughs> I know, you know and, I mean? and was, Betty's questions that some of us would be almost too timid to ask about Tom's, the way he does things. You did it. Oh, well, this, Betty's never been timid. We haven't. No. Uh, it's not one of those. No, her. but it's, friend, right. it's trust and friendship that you were talking about. I'm reading Betty's press here. Oh. oh. As you check out at the grocery counter, you see the Star Magazine, and Betty White is always in it. I'm so glad With her that's lovely not outfits, all of mm. the things that she's wearing. Oh, Betty, I can't find you on this page. Uh, wait a second. You're here. I know you're here. Just below. I'll find you. Oh, Tom. Am I the girl in the black bra? You're the Teddy? one in the black bra. <laughs> no, but on this one, Skin Magazine reveals Betty White's pinup poses. Oh, that's hysterical. That's that. That's a a riot, and <laughs> some girl is getting along. I'm getting the credit for her body. No, this is you. Isn't this you? No. This those were you. They brought those to Alan about 12 years ago and said, "Look, we have early pictures of Betty." And Alan looked at it. He said, "I wonder who that. That ain't that ain't my girl." <laughs> And they then about it? ten years later they had because we all looked alike in those days. Ten years later they brought the same pictures and put them in in there. And then by now, first of all, the ones they brought to Alan had a little fuzzy bunny suit, bra and, and panties. Well, they they airbrushed that out. So if they were the nudes. Now they've put little black strips across there. So this is not you, Betty White. I never even had a picture taken in a bathing suit. <laughs> You're like me. That's, I as, that's <laughs> as diverse as people believing that I'm Stevie Wonder. Aha! Uh -huh, uh -huh. See. <laughs> You'll never make the wait. <laughs> yeah, let's take another call. Good morning. Hello? Hello? Yeah, go right yes, ahead. My name is Sandy. I'm calling from Brookline. Um, I'm legally blind. Last Friday morning, my dog died. Oh, um, he wasn't specifically a guide dog, but he sort of taught himself how to be one and would take me around cars and not let me cross the street. And He knew how to get to all of my shops and, and just knew everything all on his own. And I think now I probably really need a, a guide dog, but how do you transition from someone who was so important Sandy, to use my whole life? Sandy, first, I know I your, dog, grieve your, first. Dog, your dog devoted his life to allowing you to be independent. That's the thing that made your dog feel best about himself. And in the guide dog schools in Morristown, New Jersey, right here, there's a dog there that wants to feel very good about itself. That dog is waiting for you, and you need to contact the Morristown Seeing Eye Dog School and tell them about your situation. Tell them that you, you loved an animal that gave uh, its life to trying to make a difference for you. But you should understand that if this dog that you loved could do so much without formal training, you haven't even begun to tap how much independence you really can have with a dog that will love you and work in a more organized way for you. You resisted in the beginning before you got Dinah, didn't you, Tom? I, I did, Eileen. And Sandy, I, I didn't know the levels that were possible. Not only can, can, could your dog uh, do those things instinctively for you, but in the formal training, you the dog learns so many other things. The correct stopping at curbs, the interpretation of a door you're looking for, a chair in a crowded room, the word elevator, uh, finding uh, particular grocery shelves that you might use all the time, retrieving of things that you need. There's no limit to what the dogs can do if you're willing to work. And, and I, I know how much you loved your animal, but please go on with this process. But Sandy, let me, let me say that there are 10 guide dog schools right. around the country, and you can get, uh, acquire that list, and there's no charge to you. And they will, they will train you, and they will bond you with a new dog. Isn't that so wonderful? So do it, honey. You know, a Nelson, now you say that, the, the, well, Nelson's had his own moments, hasn't he? <laughs> Nelson is feeling his way and getting himself used to you. And Tom, what happened on the Potomac River? Well, I, actually, I think, frankly, because you've been told what it looked like, Betty, you've got a better grasp. Well, D Tom went from this elegant golden girl, you know, who did everything in such a ladylike fashion, and she was perfect in everything. He got this horsey, two-year-old macho lab, and uh, Dinah would guide him through a door. Uh, Nelson would say, I'll get him through this sucker. I'll just do it fast <laughs> enough, and I'll get him through there. Well, they were doing a, a picture shoot for a brochure, and they were taking some lovely sunset shots on, on these rocks and on, in this canoe on the Potomac. Well, the photographer was on one rock, and Nelson didn't want to be left out. He was there near, and Tom was sitting, posing against the sunset. 
And now you must remember a Labrador Retriever is a bird dog instinctively. He can't help it, but he's a trained guide dog until a wild goose landed right on the Potomac in front <laughs> of him, off <laughs> the rock, into the water, dragging Tom and the photographer with Everybody, him. Everybody, 53 <laughs> degrees, being dragged down the Potomac by the dog who thought this was the greatest so they thing. they finally got dried off and got everything back together. Well, we'll do the shot from the canoe. That'll be much better. Nelson and the photographer in the canoe. And uh, this same, I bet this wild goose was up there saying, watch me get him this time. <laughs> Lands in front, the canoe goes over, everybody goes in the water, and all the director is saying, save the film! <laughs> save the film! <laughs> right. oh, any other Nelson stories while we're on it? Nelson the is first adventure. Oh, the, oh, your first yes. adventure. With my it. first trip with Nelson in Chicago. He's perfect. We get off the plane. He's perfect. Down the jetway, perfect. Moving toward baggage, perfect. Down the escalator, perfect. A little four-year-old child with a chocolate chip ice cream cone without breaking a step. Nelson <laughs> ate it. <laughs> <laughs> Not the child, ate the cone. Yeah. Yeah. He never <laughs> missed it. <laughs> you know, you describe Dinah as soft, Tom. A sense of softness, right? Do you have a word for Dinah, Betty? Elegance. I, I can't say anything else about it. She was just, she just assessed a, a, a situation, adjusted to it, and taught me how to adjust to it. Do you all really learn from this experience, and are you now bonded, friends in a bonding way you never thought was possible, huh? I'm the, the grandmother to their children now. That, you know, Isn't never that happened great? before. It, it, it is really true. Is it Dinah true? taught me to grow up and taught Betty to grow older. Oh, boy. The leading lady, Dinah's story. You want to be inspired and learn an awful lot at the same time. This is it, and you'll be at large.